The Australasian Society of Building Biologists Environmental Health Conference and Expo 2018 will be held in Sydney on Saturday the 27th of October. Learn how buildings in which we live, study and work can affect our health from leading medical and environmental experts. For more information and to reserve your spot, please go to asbb.org.au. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us on the line today, after a long sabbatical, is Emrys Goldsworthy. He's the Director of Athletica Physical Health. He completed a Bachelor Degree in Health Science, Musculoskeletal Therapy, which he attained at Endeavour College of Natural Health, Brisbane. He's also gained a Master's Degree in Sports Coaching, focusing on Classical Ballet Coaching at Griffith Uni. He worked in the position of Senior Lecturer in the Department of Musculoskeletal Therapy at Endeavour College of Natural Health for over nine years and now trains clinicians across Australia and internationally in vagus nerve stimulation and his system of assessment and treatment called the Functional Neuroarticular System. Emerson's interest in the body began while he was a professional classical ballet and contemporary dancer and he's a graduate of the Australian Conservatoire of Ballet, which led to a career in the Royal New Zealand Ballet. And I warmly welcome Emrys back to FX Medicine because he's going to blow my mind once again, I know. How are you, Emrys? Um, it's great <laughs> to be on again. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> so let's go back in time because we spoke earlier about vagus nerve stimulation. But can you briefly mm. recap what we're talking about here? Well, that was a while back. Um, and back then... I uh, was kind of, in, in, in my opinion, wasn't quite as refined in my approach to doing vagus nerve stimulation. I mean, of course, we didn't know as much as we know now. And even now, we're refining still, but I can imagine in five years' time, there'll be a different discussion mm. about what's going on. But uh, so vagus nerve stimulation essentially is a range of different options of therapy, of different therapies. Uh, we're going to talk about specifically one, but that either stimulate the vagus nerve specifically, either through electrical means or other kinds of uh, means that might be vibrational or whatever, but I'm referring mainly to electrical stimulation mm -hmm. through the sensory branches of the vagus nerve and, uh, in particular, the auricular sensory branch, that's the ear. Um, so the method that I use is called transcutaneous auricular vagus nerve stimulation. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but that differs from another type, which is um, an implanted vagus nerve stimulator, which, of course, is not what I'm doing. Uh, and the auricular stimulation has been shown in, in, in research and in, in plenty of papers that are coming out to be a lot more, um, where would I put it, less, less risk, of course, less yeah. risk of infection because yeah. it's applied outside of the body. Uh, there's no surgery that's needed. And also uh, it can be applied at home or in the clinic and it's actually just as effective. So that's the great thing. It's not that one is better than the other. They're both just as effective. You know, I remember way back when I was a doubter of complementary medicine and things like that, and I used to poo-poo it. And I would have initially said, what a load of poppycock. You, you can't access mm. the vagus nerve, which sort of runs. It's a cranial nerve, for goodness sake. You can't access that externally. But indeed, this vagus nerve has branches in multiple places. That's right. Uh, so the vagus nerve not only is innovating um, a raft of organs, particularly uh, more in the upper part of the viscera, uh, but it's also innovating muscles of the throat, um, sensory areas of the throat as well, even the tongue, um, the back of the tongue, uh, and the ear. And it, it's, it's multi-talented nerve, like I always say. It does, it does so much. And so when I say to a patient, okay, we're going to stimulate your vagus nerve, it does all these things, but we're going to do it through your ear. It's very perplexing for them because this nerve is unlike any other nerve in the body. And uh, although um, it does so much, it is poorly understood. Mm. Uh, people think that it's just having an effect on organs, but that's not even really its main role. Um, the best way now to describe it for me, I've really come to the conclusion that the vagus nerve is not a, it's not a doer. 
it's a sensor. It senses things, uh, and it gets and it's either gets really bad at sensing things and doesn't act appropriately, or we can ramp it up and and improve its ability to sense what's going on, particularly in the gut, and act appropriately and accordingly with uh, an anti-inflammatory effect, suppressing inflammation to talk about soon. This is something that of course we've got to re we've got to go back to our anatomy phys books and relook at the physiology and the anatomy of mm. the vagus nerve because it's a sensory organ. And this is something that mm. I, I had to topsy turvy my it was my mind. It was the way I was thinking about things because we're so often thinking more about nerves coming out of the brain and innovating. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, our muscles, for instance. And yet we, of yeah. course, know that when we get a burn, there's the um, immediate arc that goes to our spinal column and straight back, the ouch arc, right, which which mm-hmm. is an automatic arc. And then you've got that, ow, that really hurts, that I burnt myself, and that's a, a sensory organ. And it's really interesting that we, we think that the sensory organs has to be a taste, smell, eyesight, touch, mm. pressure, tickling, that sort of thing, but it can be from our gut. And this is where this exactly. whole yeah. range of research is coming from now. So it's really interesting me. Well, 80% of the fibres are sensory. So, you know, we talk about the vagus nerve, we're really just talking about it mostly about its sensory impact. Yeah. On, and, and so when you, we understand at that point that the, the, the vagus nerve is sensing the sort of what's going on in the gut, not just the level of like lipopolysaccharides that are, you know, being translocated or whatever, It's also sensing what's going on in the microbiome. It actually is able to decipher dysbiosis. It it knows, you know, and that's that's what the literature is indicating. And we're not quite there yet, exactly how or what, but it's it's deciphering this dysbiotic change and accordingly reacting to that. So, what that means for for therapy? I mean, I I'm now thinking it could be a really useful uh, therapy for dysbiosis. I mean, it's certainly been effective in SIBO, uh, but for traditional like colon dysbiosis, it may well be a very useful option. Um, of course, you know we've we've really struggled to get good therapies for uh, the, the more you know, the extreme end of dysbiosis, uh, and uh, an fecal transplant is is one of them. Mm. Um, but this might be one in the future that does assist. It might be an adjunct. It might not be the only one, but definitely could play a role. There's lots of papers coming out about its role in the microbiome. And of course, you know, microbiome research is exploding. So you can Mm. imagine that the emergence of vagal research, vagus nerve research and microbiome research, they're going to start to um, interact with each other. Is this tied in with the, you know, uh, we would be pretty much au fait with the, you know, you get butterflies in in your tummy and that's the gut brain access working. Um, you know, when you get yeah. nervous, you feel it in your tummy, and that's the vagus nerve being innervated. But what you're talking about is intestinal permeability. Well, okay, let me go back to that. So that that feeling of gut feeling. So a lot of our emotional center is actually, uh, so part of our limbic system is actually devoted to sensory um, sort of input from the gut. So our limbic system seems to process a lot of gut sensory information. What that exactly is, we're, you know, it's not well described, but uh, some of the sensory input comes from the sympathetic nervous system, so that's where it gets complicated. Some of it goes to the vagus nerve, okay? Some of it goes to the sacral nerves. It gets very complicated, uh, but a lot of it does go through the vagus nerve, and everyone wants to think it's all vagus and vagus, but there are definitely gut-to-brain axes through the sympathetic nervous system. And we like to think that the autonomic nervous system is completely split, but the vagus nerve activates sympathetic nerves. The vagus nerve activates the HPA axis. Is that a bit strange, eh? Isn't it a bit strange? Mm-hmm. I know. So, and I, you know, that doesn't even necessarily mean it's going to make that it's activating the stress response. It just means that it's activating parts of the stress system. It doesn't, and it, it, that's why neurology and neuro, neuroscience is far more complex than you read in the textbook. Mm. It's not as simple in black and white. Um, But you're right, the gut feeling, the sensation of that doesn't feel right, at least in part is vagal, at least in part, because you get that feeling of sickness, you know, that feeling of nausea, right? Um, That is vagally mediated. So you're right in that regard. So I I could even take another leap here. Can I ask, what about things like irritable bowel syndrome and indeed maybe even 
worsening the um, the zonulin response with, say, celiac disease. Yes, well, it does. I don't know if they've, and you might be able to give me more information on this, I don't know if they've found a really good pathway as to why stress induces it, other than the fact that as soon as the vagus nerve is not functioning, intestinal permeability runs rife. So the the, mm. the vagus nerve at a sensory level and mode, like a sort of a reflexive efferent motor output, is able to attenuate any excessive permeability. So if it notices that there is, you know, permeability for an extended period of time, it's able to uh, mitigate that and actually close the tight junctions. Well, that's, see, it that's seems to, how it does it directly, it seems to do it indirectly. I mean, it does it, that's for sure. That's been shown time and time again when they induce that um, in animal models. Vagus nerve stimulation prevents it from happening, uh, in, how to put it, vagus nerve stops it from happening to the extremes that it would normally happen when the, when the stimulation is done prior to, say, the induction of, say, a toxin or something like that, um, or, it, or an intestinal injury. Uh, but it also attenuates it after the injury if it's applied. So vagus nerve stimulation could be used in the patient if they're being diagnosed with intestinal permeability, uh, and it's kind of like strengthening strengthening the system to be able to self-regulate again. That's what I see intestinal permeability as is more of a, a failure of self-regulation. Yeah. I think that would be a, uh, a question to ask um, Professor Alessio Fasano. Oh, I wonder if he's looked at it. I don't know. I, of course, I'm not in communication with it. It would be very interesting. Mm. Yeah. I do read his, I love his work. Yeah. Now, in our first podcast, we spoke about vagal nerve stimulation or VNS and its mm. use on anxiety and other sort of emotional type disorders. But you also alluded to its anti-inflammatory actions, which we're talking about today. So Indeed. how does the vagus nerve influence inflammation specifically? All right. Well, I've mentioned that it's a sensor. So it senses where when things are sort of changing, where you know you might have immune cells activating, it senses this in the gut. And it appears that it can also do it peripherally. This is a new area that's being explored. But because it actually suppresses the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, they're wondering how it's actually doing that. There's, there's ways in which they're doing that, uh, the ways in which they believe it's doing that. But one of the ones that they know is that it does activate the HPA axis Okay, and it helps to release cortisol. Cortisol is anti-inflammatory. Okay, so there's an anti-inflammatory effect of cortisol. Additionally, uh, it activates the celiac ganglion um, in the uh, enteric nervous system, and that actually then goes through the spleen, and then the splenic um, T cells communicate with the macrophages, and the macrophages get suppressed in their production of TNF alpha. Of course, now that's an important finding. TNF alpha. Um, you know, probably in, in cases of rheumatoid arthritis, the most important pro-inflammatory cytokine to consider and in you know, a raft of other pro-inflammatory conditions, uh, if we can suppress the TNF-alpha levels coming from the macrophages in the spleen and then systemically from that, then we are definitely having a huge effect on systemic inflammation. Additionally, it seems to also work at the gut level. So it... it, it suppresses TNF-alpha production by suppressing NF-kappa B in macrophages at the gut wall. Mm. And it also seems to work through celiac ganglion, now we believe, at the joint level through local joint immune cells. Uh, and so it can suppress the production of TNF-alpha there as well. That's how it works with rheumatoid arthritis. So that, there's lots of different pathways. And so they're all those pathways that are considered the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathways. Mm. And when I describe it as the, the sort of sensory system is feeding back and then the motor output of suppression of inflammation, well, that's the reflex. So I call that the, anti, the cholinergic anti-inflammatory reflex. And that's what's dysfunctional uh, in a lot of these autoimmune patients. I'm not saying that's the cause, but it's certainly dysfunctional. And it's also dysfunctional in intestinal permeability uh, and it's functional in Crohn's, that's been established, and likely ulcerative colitis, although it's not been well researched, and definitely rheumatoid arthritis. It, this is just amazing stuff. So, you know, the day is going to come where people are 
being assessed, being diagnosed with these auto or other inflammatory conditions. And mm. not only will they be receiving perhaps a personalized drug approach due to their genetic profile, but also these adjunct therapies, diet, lifestyle, and also maybe a little bit of an electrical stimulation from the ear to help mm. in dampening all of these signals that are worsening their condition. I mean, it's quite amazing, this sort of stuff, really is. Well, look, I mean, these, re- these, re- these researchers, um, if you look up, you know, look up PubMed vagus nerve stimulation or even more specifically transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation, these are not in any way alternative medicine researchers. These are immunologists, rheumatologists, et cetera, neurologists, and they're from reputable, um, you know, universities. This, mm. is, this, is, this is at the... It's cutting edge. For them, it's very exciting for them. You can imagine that they wouldn't be putting on, you know, putting themselves on the line for this kind of research unless that was meaningful to them. Yeah. And uh, you see paper after paper from one author and they're going in different directions. You know, like you'll get one author focusing particularly on rheumatoid arthritis, the next on atrial fibrillation, the next one on Crohn's, the next one on migraine or depression. And... This is what's happening. You'll see, you're seeing these particular authors working on one condition, but the condition list goes on and it keeps increasing. Like I, there's papers now coming out with autism and ASD, you know, ASD and ADHD, and that's sort of a new area. But it, it just goes on and on and on. And, and neuroinflammation, we should we'll talk about that today. Um, huge one, you know. And, and hopefully one day it'll, it will show some great. Um, effect if it's done in the appropriate way or the appropriate setting for things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. I'm hoping that's something. You mentioned earlier you spoke about other nerves that are being used for various conditions and you just mentioned atrial fib AF. Am I right in saying that is it was it the facial nerve that was being stimulated and having some effect on AF? Is that right? Uh, I'm not aware of that research. And, and any other nerve facial... apart from vagus? Uh, well, I mean, you've, you've got certainly sympathetic nerves. I mean, there are, there are the nerves that you'll probably hear sometimes about that relate to similar structures and systems, autonomic, mm. um, although this is not an autonomic nerve. Uh, they use the phrenic nerve for essential sleep apnea. I know that's not atrial fibrillation. Uh, I'm not aware of any other neurostimulation being done for AF. Gotcha. But for very AF, the vagus nerve um, has been proven clinically for me and in the research, research to have such a positive effect. You know, it has a really good effect on the refractory period during the heartbeat. So you have this, like, period of no beat, and it's extended during, like, for, from vagus nerve stimulation. So when the vagus nerve is not working, you can get, like, little beats in there, and that's, that's essentially where you're getting, like, an arrhythmia occurring. Yeah. And it will suppress that activity. And that's that's been well proven. It's not, and but it doesn't. There's not enough uh, randomised controlled trials with huge numbers um, being done yet. But clinically, works a treat. It's amazing to see uh, people's heart rate, heartbeat just go down as you're treating them in one session. You go, you know, start in a bit of tachycardia, and it just goes down to like sixty to seventy beats per minute um, within ten minutes, and or, or a little bit longer. Uh, it's great to see, like great to see the results immediately. And then it, it gets maintained. Often they'll come in two to three weeks later after you know a few weeks of treatment, and we're already starting with them at normal, normal uh, heart rate. Yeah, this is the thing that is really quite astounding to me is how quickly it acts. You know, we spoke about anxiety and, and just how quickly it can have an effect on somebody who's extremely nervous, who's who's going through a, a, mm. an attack. When you're talking about inflammation and neuroinflammation, normally these are more smoldering type conditions that take a long while to get a positive effect from therapy that's measurable in yeah. the bloods. So what about yeah. blood markers change from using this therapy? Do you see a like a very quick drop like AF or do you see something that tends to dissolve over a period of time? All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the recent paper that came out for RA patients, the rheumatoid arthritis patients that were also epileptic. So these are ones that had the implanted device, uh, epileptics. The, ep- the implanted device has been used for epileptics for a while. Uh, it was the first condition which was um, approved for. But they are now using the research on people who have also had RA, who've also got epilepsy. And uh, so I'll tell you their markers. So they, at baseline, which was a day 21 for them, their average um, interleukin-6 was 7.7. And at day 42, it was 5.6. 
uh, not a huge drop, but a significant drop. TNF Alpha, which is the big one, mm. was at 3,765 at baseline and went down to 1,835. Wow. Day 42. So that's, and then CRP, 12 to 6 in that time as well. So that's a significant number. That's mm. almost within range. Um, so CRP and TNF, they're the big ones there. And another one that blood market that, go, that changes, um, depending on the paper you look at and what they're measuring, is interleukin-10. So that's an anti-inflammatory um, cytokine. And that goes up, of course. And so that interleukin-10, from the research I've read, inhibits interferon gamma and TNF-alpha. So again, another... Um, cytokine that's sort of working in our favor and stra- and of course it lowers interleukin 1 beta so that's a, the, you know, the, your normal cy- pro-inflammatory cytokine so CRP, interleukin 6, interleukin 1 beta and um, TNF alpha all lowered interestingly it at a blood level it lowers cortisol now I wanted hmm. to mention this because so cortisol is lowered in the blood after you know, weeks and weeks of vagus nerve stimulation, uh, but it activates the HP axis. How does it, why is it lowering cortisol in one marker yet on a, on a sort of an efferent level it's activating HPA? My belief is that it's improving, it's reducing any cortisol resistance that might be there. So cortisol resistance, you know, too much cortisol over time makes the body resistant to cortisol uh, and it must be sensitizing the body to cortisol. Because I've used cortisol as a marker, so like diurnal patterns of cortisol, and you'll, you'll see like patterns where people are just tired all the time and have high cortisol, and that doesn't really, you know, you'd think that they'd be a bit more um, up than that. Um, and I see the cortisol lowers and the energy rises in them. Yeah. So there's like a lowering of cortisol and a, and a sort of a homeostasis of the energy systems that are occurring. So that's a really interesting thing. So cortisol resistance seems to be attenuated, at least maybe not directly from research, but it seems to be clinically happening from from what I've seen. And are these blood markers changing in correlation with improvement in disease state? Yeah. So in that paper I mentioned, they, they, they directly correlate with a reduction in the joint pain and in the improved you know, movement of the joint itself. So those two, the, the blood markers co- nearly always correlate with a reduction in pain yeah. and an improvement in movement. Clinically for me, when I'm using it for someone who's got like a cortisol resistance or, you know, HP axis dysfunction, that kind of thing, uh, their stress levels go down. So their coping mechanisms improve. Their anxiety levels go down. That If they're, uh, let's just say they've got poor energy in the morning uh, or throughout the day, uh, fatigue. Fatigue seems to be attenuated. Um, fatigue isn't attenuated in everyone. I guess it depends on the cause. You know, it's a non-specific symptom. Yeah. You know, you know, heterogeneity for fatigue. But fatigue is one that I often use vagus nerve stimulation for. I'm I'm treating a few. There's a theory that the vagus nerve is uh, infected. I don't know if this is if this is true or not. We don't know yet. But in conditions such as chronic fatigue syndrome. There's a belief by some authors that the vagus nerve has been infected by some herpes virus, and it's causing a you know a fatigue-like state. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but I've I've found great results with chronic fatigue syndrome over time, over time. Certainly not overnight. It being a rather confounding multifactorial condition, um, have yeah. you found that it sort of you know waxes and wanes and acts on certain? aspects of you know pain and inflammation rather than others have you found any parts where it acts better than others pain i'd say because it suppresses inflammation when it's excessive i mean it doesn't suppress inflammation when it's appropriate that's really important to remember so if you're having vagus nerve stimulation after an injury it doesn't suppress the inflammation to the point where you don't heal it suppresses it if it's excessive because the body is smart enough to know uh, so, for example, a joint itch that has too much inflammation and that's causing pain and reduction in movement, the, the pain levels are the first thing to go down and normally that is just soon followed by improvements in movement, if, particularly if it's to do with swelling. So then uh, when it comes to just pain alone, 
treatment for inflammation is very different in vagus nerve stimulation for, than for treatment for pain. If it's inflammatory pain, that's one treatment type. If it's centrally mediated pain, like a neurogenic style of inflammation, which is different to primary inflammation, like mm. immune-mediated inflammation, yeah. it's very different. Um, that's more substance P related, CGRP. That's done differently. That's if you, So as the clinician, they need to know the difference between the two. And uh, if you don't, you're not going to treat a pro- – I, I can tell you now, if you treat someone in uh, what we call sort of trying to sort of, um, down-regulate uh, the pain centers of the brain, the, what's called the pain neuromatrix, mm. which is a very different um, parameter, parameters that are used, you won't get the same effect for an inflamed joint that's got pain if you use a pr- anti-inflammatory treatment. And that's really obvious clinically. And it's really obvious in the literature too. So why? I'm not really sure. Why is it that a, that one like hurts for, for one condition is different and for the other it's it's compl- like completely opposite? And yet they're very similar, but they're not they're not at a uh, um, physiological level. Well, this is, as I understand it, and it is not a great understanding at all, but things like CRPS, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, is basically a feedback loop that's gone awry, so it's looping within itself. Is that right? Yep, yeah, yeah. There, that's a pretty complicated condition. You know, clinically, I've seen that's a very neuropathic condition yeah. as well. Uh, there's a big sympathetic component to it. Uh, is it vagal? certainly would never suggest that it's a vagus nerve problem by itself. Is the vagus nerve a problem in them? Certainly. Yeah. Uh, you don't see a lot of them in clinic. They're, well, they're not be that stressed. common. Yeah. And, I mean, that's like, isn't that the holy grail, like reducing stress and the stress yeah, response, that's sympathetic right. dominance? And, you know, and that, that, is, that is eventually a pro-inflammatory condition. If, if you're chronically stressed, you know, you're, you're going to eventually be chronically inflamed. Yeah, and that's that's the something that we want to sort of reverse. And that it, most of the time, you'll see clinicians either working on like an anti-inflammatory diet, anti-inflammatory lifestyle, reducing environmental toxins, all this sort of usual suspects, which are really important. But a lot of the time, the vagus nerve is just sit, sitting there, not being uh, looked at. Mm. And online, you know, you go online, look up vagus nerve stimulation. You're going to get a raft of strange home exercises that are not really based on science, they're sort of based on opinion and a few small studies that aren't really very indicative of, of, of really a specifically vagus nerve. And you've really got to get, you know, it, it worked on the vagus nerve specifically in a way that's clinically relevant, clinically mediated. Not uh, You can do all sorts of things at home like gargling and uh, the mammalian diver's reflex, but they're, they're not as good as, a clinically clinical approach. It's not just for like any sort of like anything, isn't it? Well, it's it? like anything. But I just think it's really interesting that there's work being done by using the twilight hypnotic drugs prior mm. to surgery, majorly for the action of decreasing anxiety. And it's the yeah. feeling of stress about the forthcoming operation that gives them pain mm. after the operation reduce the stress prior to it, and you reduce the requirement for hardcore pain-relieving drugs afterwards. That operations one is an interesting um, topic. So if you had vagal stimulation prior to surgery, you are basically preparing your vagus nerve for the onslaught that's going to occur, right? Yeah. And preventing it from being uh, your immune system from overactivating. And that's what happens. That's been shown time and time again. Vagus nerve stimulation attenuates overactivity in the immune system. That's essentially the role of what the vagus nerve does, at least in this context. So if you have it before surgery, you're at least reducing the risk for an excessive overactive immune response after the surgery, which can really suppress healing times. You know, and, and that's although it's required initially, it can go on, you know, um, a bit too long. And that's what that often um, affects people's long long term recovery times. And the other thing is that where you talked about anxiety, now we know that vagus nerve seems to vagus nerve stimulation seems to normalize glutamate GABA levels. So GABA goes up, glutamate goes down. That kind of um, balance is returned. That's why it works well with epilepsy, and that's also why, and most likely because it's suppressing neuroinflammation, which promotes that imbalance. 
Uh, but it also works on serotonin levels going up, norepinephrine levels and dopamine levels going up, which is sort of indicative of an anti-inflammatory state in the, in the brain. You know, I just see so many opportunities here, so far ranging, not just inflammatory, but let's look at the worldwide opioid scourge that we're seeing at the moment and the choices that are offered. The medication choices are, you know, more often than not, they're like an NSAID or a paracetamol, both of which have, have their own issues, not just bleeding, but also toxicity that we're seeing more and more an issue. And this might be something where practitioners of all walks of life can initiate a safe therapy that takes away that huge cost and social medical burden of not just the opioids, but the side effects from the alternatives. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at the, you know, the, I mean, this can go on for a long time, this discussion, because <laughs> yeah. we, the, the yep. concept of uh, how doctors are just giving out, you know, opioids or opiates uh, for chronic pain or neuropathic pain or conditions that are just prolonged and they're not really given any other option. You know, we know that a lot of these people are going to have a lot of other systems involved, you know, depression, anxiety, gut problems, the list goes on, and environmental factors, and it's not being addressed. And we know that a lot of these these conditions are not, you know, single entities. They're multi-system, pro-inflammatory, systemic inflammation, you know, this kind of thing, mm. and that's not being addressed. And so, you know, we, all natural fats will say start the gut, right? Uh, and it's true. Yep. It really is true. And if you look at the immune system, the majority of the immune system is there and the vagus nerve is actually there what being, you know, the watchdog over what's going on and, and acting appro- uh, you know, acting to suppress it when it's inappropriate. This intera- this 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 little network of neurons and, and bodily, you know, and organs is so important and it's actually likely, you know, a lot of a lot of authors are talking about fibromyalgia and, and gut problems being linked and things like that. And, I mean, with the, the, the term fibromyalgia for me is not really helpful. It doesn't really tell me what to do. It doesn't really tell me why they've got it. Uh, and I feel that often you'll get one fibromyalgia patient that comes in and, you know, they're on um, some kind of, you know, pregabalin or gabapentin or something, um, and and – there's no, and they're completely different to the next fibromyalgia patient. They've got a completely different set of uh, secondary or comorbid conditions, and that's the problem. They they need to be treated as individual, and that's just not happening. They're given the same drug. Hopefully, it works. And mm. the whole idea is, I think, and this is why I say use this in conjunction with you know nutritional medicine, with lifestyle medicine, with like looking at environmental factors and and you know and so on. And they're going to get to getting, you know, getting to the bottom of their condition rather than just trying to suppress symptoms. That's my last thing I want to do. I don't want to just try to suppress. And that's not what the therapy does. It actually enhances the body's own endogenous, um, you know, suppression of inflammation rather than just actively and directly suppressing inflammation, which I think is a bit of a of a different way yeah. of approaching it. But, but I think likewise from, you know, medications just being handed out, how many natural therapists would think of um, treating the gut, quote unquote, by, and I don't mean this as glibly as it sounds, tickling the ear? You know, how many people yeah. would would think about treating your vagus nerve rather than looking at things that go in your mouth to treat your gut? Well, most most people would think that the gut to brain axis is a one way street. Mm. You know, and it, it is certainly not. And my argument would be that it's certainly either equally both directions. Um, but I mean, even if you say, okay, uh, the vagus nerve um, it receives information from the gut. So it's the gut that matters. Well, we know that people who've had traumatic brain injuries, uh, they immediately get intestinal permeability. Yeah. So the, when the brain is injured, the gut suffers. What's that about? That's mm. the brain-to-gut axis. It's not the gut-to-brain axis. Yeah. And so we know that uh, when you stimulate the vagus nerve, you're basically sensitizing it, and you're improving its feedback system and its output system. Okay, so it's both directions. And I think that if you're a clinician out there really wanting to work in gut-to-brain axis kind of medicine, which is kind of a new field, you need to consider both directions and you need to have a legitimate therapy that basically works from the brain to the gut, not just from the gut to the brain, Mm. okay? And that's the whole role of this. 
And it's like the highway. If the highway is broken, if the highway is not, you know, functioning, it doesn't really matter what you do with the gut for the most part. You know, it has to function to work as a sensory system. And if it's not working, it, you know, you can imagine a lot of those therapies that people are trying to do to um, improve, you know, gut-to-brain actions or, you know, working on inflammation in the gut, it, it may not work as well or at all. Now, you, you mentioned Parkinson's and other neuroinflammatory conditions pro, um, previously. Tell us more about this and just how effective can vagus nerve stimulation be in, I mean, there's a, there's a plethora of conditions here, but where does it fit? Where does it work? All right. So the main two findings in regards to neuroinflammation is, is one, uh, which firstly I should mention that the blood-brain barrier becomes more permeable um, in neuroinflammation conditions, inflammatory yeah. conditions, and that is like one of the signs of neuroinflammation, blood-brain barrier permeability, a basic leaky brain. You've probably heard of that. Yep. Um, the other one is that the microglia go, um, they kind of can turn into a pro-inflammatory state, so microglial activation, call it. Uh, those two particular areas are of key importance because vagus nerve stimulation has, def- without, you know, in more than two papers has, attenuated blood-brain barrier permeability. So it does it not only in the gut, but it does it in, in the brain. Mm. And also, it actually changes the phenotype of microglia towards what's called the M2 phenotype, which is an anti-inflammatory microglial state. So you're changing the state of the pet, so the sort of neuroinflammatory milieu. It becomes more normalized in homeostasis. And goes away from that, you know, degrading state of inflammation towards back to building state, and that promotes things like brain derived neurotransmitters. Neurotrans- factor, I was just going to say, with, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, and also the neurotransmitters normalize in their levels when you have all of these things yeah. heading in that direction. So that's it's a really useful technique for any neuroinflammatory condition. And we know that there is, you know, ASD. Um, you can see it in that condition as well as well as all, you know, normal types of dementias and so on. And so this is a new field. It's not as established as depression, although it may well be, you know, neuroinflammation, depression may be a part of that. So there is a link there. But um, it's certainly one of the burgeoning areas in the research and also in therapy. But I've had really good success with it. But uh, by no means will I ever say any of these conditions go away overnight. It's like training. You go to the gym. You train your arms, you want to build up your arm muscles, you're not going to get it overnight. It's going to take weeks and months of mm. treatment and, or, of exercise. And vagus nerve stimulation is exercising the vagus nerve. So it takes time for it to get good at what it does. What about, though, you mentioned ASD. That's really interesting to me. Have you seen effects, positive effects, with vagal nerve stimulation and how responsive are these kids to the intervention of that thing on their ear? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, that's, that is the issue. Uh, some that you're just never going to be able to do it. They, um, their ability to stand, uh, withstand that kind of stimulation is not going to happen. Yeah. So they're not appropriate for treatment, at least in with this electrostimulation. Others, you know, they're different part of the spectrum, uh, and and you're working particularly on frontal lobe activity, and so attention span and ability to sort of engage with another person, you know, eye to, you know, eye to eye and not have that, you know, looking around the room behavior or sometimes it might even be just cognition. So you're working on their cognitive function and, and that's been shown to be quite effective, vagus and stimulation of cognitive function in ASD in the research. Uh, every ASD patient is different. You know, you kind of have to approach it, like, what do we want to achieve, okay? Well, let's measure that and then let's measure it again in a month or two after, you know, doing the stimulation on a week-by-week basis. Yeah. And, yeah, I've mainly seen it in attention uh, and focus and uh, cognitive function. They're yeah. the main ones that yeah. change. It's slow change. You know, ASD is very hard to treat, very difficult to treat, and I would say that you would look at it as sort of an adjunctive therapy in line with all the other sort of nutritional therapies that they're normally on uh, over the course of years rather than months. Can I ask, though, you mentioned... Um, or we've mentioned singing um, previously in the previous yeah. podcast. And I am quite 
interested. I can't mm-hmm. say astounded. I haven't seen it used as a therapy, but I'm quite interested in the aspect that some people with this sort of lack of focus and even processing disorders, when they put some sort of accentuation rather than speech, some sort of highs and lows attributable to singing, it tends to stick with them. They can read more fluently. They can remember. They can process the story and have a more comprehensive um, outlook on it. Have you ever seen results yourself in this? Uh, I don't use singing a lot. It's sort of a hard thing to sort of in, sort of introduce to some people. <laughs> what's um, what's singing? <laughs> singing, yeah, exactly. Um, embarrassment and things like that. But yeah, no, in my instance, it's screaming. Imagine, yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> uh, I think it's healthy to sing, and I think it, it, it's likely going to improve your vagus nerve function because the vagus nerve is controlling phonation. Um, majority of the of it is, is vaguely mediated. And uh, so speaking and singing, you know, really stimulates it. And you see that with people who, you know, have vagus nerve problems. Often, they're, you know, who are singers, their 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 voice um, has been affected by that vagus nerve problem that they have. Um, but singing again, you know, as a, as a therapy, you can imagine it being a potential. Particularly, I, you know, in my opinion, it would be probably more operatic, or at least um, where there's more vocal range rather than. Um, yeah, that's that kind of singing. Maybe group singing is obviously a really good way of getting people into it. Um, less embarrassment, I guess, um, than trying to do solo work. But I, I think also anything where you're in a group setting is going to be uh, helpful for your anxiety levels. Um, if you're, unless you've got group anxiety, but you know, I would say that that's generally a quite a positive therapy for most people. Yeah. And uh, long term, it can really help with health outcomes. I've harped on how important this is for practitioners to link into and they need to know what they're doing. They need to know how to do it properly. Where can yep. they learn more about this? Because I know you do courses. Yeah. Yep. So I have three portals of which I advertise my cor- my courses through Facebook, Emra Scholes with the BHSC, which is just Dance of Bachelor of Science. It's my credential. Um, and then also um, Emra underscore goals with the underscore BHSC at Instagram and then emrisgoldsley.com is my website. And so all of it will be on there. Instagram seems to be the one I update most often. Um, and so you'll see I'm doing courses on vagus nerve stimulation all around Australia at the moment. Um, and next year I'll be taking it to Europe. So it's a pretty exciting time. And um, I just recently did one in Canada. Yeah. It's great. And yeah, everyone's loving it, and it's great because I've got group. I've got a, a Facebook group of all the different clinicians that have done the course, and it's great to see some amazing, like um, amazing treatment outcomes that they've had, um, and, and and conditions that I've never seen in my own clinic. They're seeing, and they're getting great treatment outcomes. I'm I'm so excited about the potential once more people know how to use this therapy. Yeah. So yeah, well, I do certification program, a certification program in the method that I teach in the methods I use, and just look up on those sites uh, for more information. And I also understand you've, is it you've just done or you're just about to do a talk with the Australian Traditional Medicine Society, the ATMS, is that right? Yes, I recently uh, done a webinar um, uh, with them, uh, and yes, that that webinar has been recorded, and it's available on the ATMS website. Imris, thank you so much. Again, you've blown my mind. (laughs) <laughs> Seriously, I'll I keep you back on. Well, you back on. <laughs> well, I keep looking at these opportunities that we're just not thinking about, and we just we really need to hook into this because it's a a safe, externally applied therapy that everybody could learn to use. It just needs a an appropriately trained um, clinician to take them through how to do that, and so that's where we really need to get the word out there. Indeed, I hope I hope everyone who listened today uh, can see the benefit and can see how they might be able to implement this therapy in their own practice. And, and yeah, hopefully they can come and attend uh, one of the certifications. And we've certainly got a, a legion of uh, references to put up on the FX Medicine website to, so that people can follow through you know, some of the research um, strands that are going on. It's quite comprehensive. Indeed. And, and, and if you're just wanting to research, just go PubMed and put in vagus nerve stimulation, vagus nerve... Um, transcutaneous focus and stimulation and uh, I'll give you a year to read through all of those papers. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Emrys. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. 
FX Medicine is your gateway to news, resources and information on the safe, evidence-based approach to practising complementary and integrative medicine. Visit fxmedicine.com.au to sign up for e-news and stay up to date with the latest research, podcasts and industry information.